before we start, let's just tick a couple of things off to make sure there's a baseline to work from. Picking 10 characters might offer up some really obvious contenders, Khan being the prime culprit. However, since he only has to wait 15 years for a reappearance, this is, bizarrely, a drop in the mighty Trek ocean. Thanks to the arrival of the streaming era, there are now many characters who have made their presence known in new and ever more inventive ways. Considering that, this video focuses purely on the Prime Universe since the Kelvin crew are technically not the same versions of the characters that we met in the original series. If we did, then the gap would be from 1994 for Kirk, Chekhov and Scotty, and even less if we count 1996's Trials and Tribulations and flashback 30th anniversary episodes. Therefore, we are only looking at persons who grace the franchise with their presence outside of the main series cast and would be seen many, many years later in the same timeline, although potentially played by different actors. Yes, there may well be some animation in there to spice up the mix too, and this provides a web of connections trailing across the whole franchise history right back, as fans would hope and expect, to the cage. And so, with that in mind, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture. Here with 10 Star Trek characters we had to wait years to see again. Number 10. Swear a Blood Oath Featured in each of the three seasons of the original series respectively, Kor, Koloth and Kang would wait up to 27 years for a return in Star Trek in Deep Space Nine's second season, Blood Oath. While Koloth and Kang would meet their deaths, avenging their murdered sons against the albino, Kor returned for two more appearances in The Sword of Kalos and Once More Unto the Breach, providing the character with his own Deep Space trilogy. As the first Klingon in Star Trek, John Kolokos as Kor faced not just Kirk and Spock, but also the Organians during Errand of Mercy. His performance would set the standard for the warrior race throughout the ages, with the Baldric inspired from his first appearance still worn by Worf in Star Trek Picard. The character also managed an impressive arc through his later appearances. Recovering from a washed-out drunk to harm master, Kor goes full Indiana Jones to recover the fabled sword of Kalos before dying an honourable death against the Dominion. Number 9. Prime Pike Controversial call on this one. While Pike does appear in 2009's J.J. Abrams' spectacular reboot, it's an alternative version of the character and sort of cheating. But that's nothing against Bruce Greenwood, but, well, it kind of is cheating. In that case, the last time that Prime Universe Christopher Pike appeared in Star Trek was November 1966, when The Menagerie was aired. Combining footage from The Cage, where Pike was played by Jeffrey Hunter, the now wheelchair-bound captain was portrayed by Sean Kenny in the Kirk-era scenes. An incredible 53 years later, and that same version of the Enterprise captain would be back on the bridge for the beginning of Star Trek Discovery's second season, this time played by Anson Mount. Such was the draw of Mount alongside Ethan Peck's Spock and Rebecca Romaine's number one that by 2022, Strange New Worlds would be on screen. This possibly marked the longest gestation period from the pilot episode to realisation of a full series, given that The Cage was produced in 1964, although not officially aired until the 90s. Cleverly, Pike's knowledge of his own fate has been so into the series, providing a new layer to the character as he heads towards his destiny. Number 8. His name is Mud. His original series appearances may polarise fans with a certainly over-the-top performance from Roger C. Carmel. This was unequivocally brought bang up to date thanks to Rain Wilson in Discovery's first season and subsequent short trek. Harcourt Fenton Mud bears the honour of being the only guest antagonist to have two appearances in the original series, being in Mud's Women for the first season and I Mud for season two. If we push the starship out a little further, then it could be argued he has three appearances, with Carmel also voicing the rogue trader in the animated series Mud's Passion. Going by live-action appearances though, Harry Mud manages bang on 40 years between appearances in 1967 and 2017. Also, managing two live-action appearances in Choose Your Pain and Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad, this Mud is a much darker, more calculating character than established in his later years from the original series. Indeed, magic to make the sanest man go mad provides the show with a fascinating time loop that sees Mud attempting to turn the tables for his own advantage. Of course. His last turn in the short, The Escape Artist, hinted at future slash past escapades with android duplicates. Number 7. China in your hands Images of Carol Decker on top of the pops aside, one could say that T'Pau is the heart and soul of Vulcan. First seen in the original series' first trip to Spock's homeworld in a mock time, the matriarch of Vulcan society oversaw the combative Cal-E-Fee ritual between Kirk and Spock. Q, appropriate. 
appropriate battle music now. Played by actress Celia Lovsky, Tapao unusually performed the Vulcan salute left-handed as she found it easier to manipulate the fingers on that hand. Back in 1967, no one had any idea of the significance or how the episode, the culture, and this most stoic of stoic Vulcans would become such an integral part of the franchise. Flash forward some 36 years and several series before, we would get a real-world return of Tapao in the Enterprise trilogy of The Forge, Awakening, and Kirshara. Set before a mock time, Tapao was played by Kara Zedeka, who physically appeared in only the second two episodes of the three. In the forge, she appeared on a display, which was added later as the role was only cast for Awakening. Number 6. Armus and Friends The list of reappearances in Lower Decks is almost as long as its list of episodes. One that does require its own entry on the list due to the nature of that character's first appearance in 1988 is the humanoid oil slick Armus, which stands out amongst the villains of the Next Generation's first season purely on the basis that it killed Tasha Yar in Skin of Evil. After taking a fatal and unprovoked swipe at Lieutenant Yar, Armus would also manage to gobble up and spit out Commander Riker, with Jonathan Frakes later recalling that LeVar Burton was concrete on the fact that he would not have allowed himself to be covered head to toe in black goop. Left alone on the desolate Vagra 2, Lower Decks would drop one of its best closing scenes thanks to Mariner finding a sub-manifold casting stone during a nominal Consolidation Day. This allows the Lower Decks to throw their voices across the galaxy and prank cool the lonely skin of evil. The more adult orientated animation even managed to work in a visual reference to those old scientists with the animated series Kirk and Spock on screen after 17 years. Number 5. Less Than Outrageous O'Connor Gaining his own entry on the list has to be Billy Campbell's Thadian O'Connor. Managing to woo a pre-Lois and Clark Terry Hatcher is usually noted in the same breath about one of TNG's, for better or worse, most memorable second season episodes. Campbell makes the list as one of the few not to return in live action, but as an animated incarnation in both Lower Decks and Prodigy. 2021's An Embarrassment of Duplers would see the delinquent dealer DJing at the Starfleet captain's party, although O'Connor would have no speaking part in this fleeting appearance. His two-episode run in Crossroads and Masquerade from 2022's second half of Prodigy's first season, granted that missing vocal ability. Now sporting an eye patch and as charming as ever, Campbell reprised his TNG character some 33 years after he helped out a pair of star-crossed lovers. Perhaps a little slimier than in The Next Generation, O'Connor remains up to his old tricks in the smuggling game. However, when the chips are down, he's the first out of the picture and leaves the scene even more quickly than he appeared. Number 4. Edith Keeler Must Die One of Star Trek's most most unexpected returns came thanks to Discovery. Offloaded as one of the finest installments of science fiction TV, The City on the Edge of Forever is an undeniable classic of the franchise. Although only in the episode for a fraction of the story, the wheels of the table are set in motion by the luminescent Guardian of Forever. A forgotten portal on an ancient planet, the Guardian would actually return twice. Once just six years later in the animated series Yesteryear, and then 47 years later in Terra firmer. The reveal that Carl was the Guardian of Forever only comes at the very end of the two-part story, and opens the path for Michelle Yeoh's Giorgio to kick off her Section 31 film. What Discovery also provides is a bit of backstory for the Guardian. Seen as an important element during the Temporal Cold War, it moved itself to Danis V to keep out of harm's way. At some point as well, the Guardian was capable of manifesting itself as a humanoid figure complete with a chair and newspaper. For now though, let's get the hell out of here. Number 3. Law Don't Slow Me Down Brent Spiner certainly isn't a stranger to Star Trek, portraying members of the Sung Dynasty across the next generation, Enterprise and Picard. While this is a range of six different characters, it's one of his earliest that now makes a chilling return. Pipped only by a few months by Moriarty, Law last chewed out some scenery back in 1993's Season 6 Closer and Season 7 Opener, Descent. However, flashback a few years and the data 
duplicate was first seen in 1987's first season, Data Law. Able to understand and express emotions, Law can contract words and, if viewers will remember, initially had a facial tick that set the pair apart. All that was probably needed extra was a sinister Spock goatee. Law's return in Brothers was, from Noonien Sung's perspective, unexpected, since the message he sent out was intended for Data. This would have tragic consequences for the pioneering cyberneticist. In terms of Law, though, this reappearance as the saviour of an individualised collective of Borg in descent seemed to prove his final act. However, it would now seem that Picard will prove something of an epilogue to the character's Star Trek arc. But we won't say anything more than that for fear of spoilers. Number 2. The Game's Afoot again. Who wasn't excited for the return of Data's greatest opponent? Daniel Davis clocked up two appearances in The Next Generation as Sherlock Holmes' nemesis. First was Moriarty's creation in one of the show's early classics, Elementary Dear Data, before returning four years later in a sequel that surpasses the original Ship in a Bottle. Davis, who in a fun twist would play an officer aboard the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise CVN-65 in The Hunt for Red October, reprised his seminal Trek role 30 30 years later. This places him with one of the longest gaps between appearances. Moriarty himself has also been active outside of the television universe of Star Trek. The literary universe saw him return in Jeffrey Lang's 2014 novel The Light Fantastic, a story capitalising on the earlier, novel spoilers, resurrection of Data. Though his return was all too brief in Star Trek Picard, it was still a welcome appearance from one of Data's greatest foes. Number 1. Row, row, row. Row your titan. Ro Laren was and remains one of the most popular secondary characters in the Star Trek franchise. First appearing in the fifth season of The Next Generation, she made such an impact that her first episode was named for her, and then her sporadic appearances were spread out for the rest of the show. There was barely a bum note for Ro with each of her episodes, which always delivered an interesting twist on what we had seen before. She began with butting heads with Picard before becoming, for a time, one of his favourite most trusted officers. Her last episode of The Next Generation, Preemptive Strike, saw this relationship brought down by a battle of conscience. Rose's defection to the Marquis was marked with only one regret, letting Jean-Luc down. It would take 30 years to see her again. The fifth episode of Star Trek Picard's third season, Imposters, sees Rose finally return, now as a commander. This was a curveball not just for Picard, but for the audience as well. The last that we saw, she was a defector. Now she's a Starfleet officer, working for Starfleet intelligence no less. The pathos of Ro and Picard's scenes were, thankfully, worth the wait. That scene in the holodeck is one of the most affecting scenes, one full of catharsis that served to offer the audience a resolution three decades in the making. Whether you think Ro was a terrorist who portrayed her uniform or a principled hero who did what they had to do, Ro Laren was one of the biggest shocks and greatest payoffs in Star Trek's history of making the audience wait. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed someone, then do let us know in the comments below and while you're there don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell so you never miss a Trek culture video ever again. Also head over to Twitter and Instagram to follow us there and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Littlechild. I've been Ellie with Trek culture. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.